Hi, my name is Sami Suhonen and I work as the head of physics department in Tampere University of Applied Sciences. On this video I will tell you some basics about learning analytics and give a few examples from TAMC. What is learning analytics? Learning analytics and knowledge conferences call for papers tells this nicely. Learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs. So, it is the use of digital footprint that the students leave on uh, digital platforms, for example LMS, Learning Management System, or other digital footprints which are generated by learning. And the main purpose of learning analytics is to help students to learn and study. On the right you can see a graph of Google Trends um, interests on search terms learning analytics, which is in blue, and the same in Finnish, Optimis Analytica, which is in yellow. And from this graph you can see that uh, learning analytics is an emerging trend it was almost non-existent eight years ago and started to rise, the interest started to rise in 2010, 2011 uh, in, in general. But in Finland we are lagging a little bit behind. The interest started to increase only, well, 2014 maybe. But we are trying to speed up. And if you haven't heard about learning analytics before, it's no wonder. It's a new trend in education in general. There are other similar terms as well. One is academic analytics. Academic analytics tries to find answers to questions like um, from which geographic location do people come to certain universities or how has the entrance examination points uh, varied across the years and so on. It kind of a, gives a big picture of the education in general or an institution in general. And I'm not going to talk about that. Let's concentrate on learning analytics, which can then be divided to the following topics. Analytics of learning, analytics of studying, analytics of physical learning environments, biometrics, and analytics of teaching. And what, the, what do these then mean? Of course, there is some overlap between these areas, but I will give a few examples how I understand this. And first, analytics of learning. This picture is from one of my own courses. And on the left, there are the learning objectives of one week. And of course, the list continues then for other weeks as well. And on the right hand side is the self evaluation of all the students. So they need to evaluate themselves how well they understand or have the knowledge and skills for this. Uh, learning objectives and then as a, as a teacher I can concentrate on those parts which the students find most hard to understand. So this is kind of a very simple basic approach to analytics of learning. So next one is analytics of studying and uh, this is something most of the learning management systems do they gather data, the footprint, about who did what and when. And this is then visualized by drawing different kinds of graphs, for example. And for the student, this tells how he or she is progressing in the course. And for teacher, of course, the progress is Im important as well. But the, then the teacher can use this as a tool to find those students who have difficulties in learning, a tool for intervention and tutoring, but also for teacher it tells how his or her materials are used and as such it's a tool for developing those materials or developing the whole curricula or degree programs. Anyhow this shouldn't be only the teacher's tool but I feel that it would be great if we could better serve the students by providing them access to the data. 
for example using graphs like this. I'm sorry this isn't finished but on the upper graph there is the number of log events for the student in yellow, for the group average in green and the previous cohort past students in blue. And the lower graph is for completed assignments and the percentage is the overall progress in the course. Then analytics of physical environments. And this can be simple quantities like temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels in the classroom for example or the occupancy of different spaces in the university campus area or tracking people moving around the campus or if you consider um, physical simulation for example in, in healthcare it could be measurement of uh, the students attention where do the students look at during the simulation or the exercise how where do they pay attention to and so on Anyways, it's something that is measured in physical learning environment. Biometrics. This is probably the most recent branch of learning analytics. It's using wearable biosensors for understanding learning and studying processes. And uh, I'm not an expert at all in this field. This could be, for example, using pulse or heart rate variation to find out the stress levels or, or uh, relaxation. But also there are some studies in which people are trying to find whether the students are in a flow state of mind or not. And so on. And finally, analytics of teaching. And, uh, well, at least one thing which would interest me very much is try to find out where does my time go as a teacher. This could be an example of analytics of teaching. Let's continue to data sources. So what are the typical data sources in general and in TOMC? Well, the first one is learning management systems log file. The other one is the grades and credits in study register. And uh, let's start with the learning management system. When a student uploads an assignment to the Moodle, then to the log file, the date, time, student name, action, IP address, browser and system are written. And the learning management system records all the actions students take on the platform. Then about the grades in study reg register, when a teacher gives the assessment, then the student name, course, grade, date and assessor are saved to the file. These two sources are maybe the most typical ones in learning analytics, at least in TOMC. But then there are other sources as well. For example, I use YouTube analytics and also WhatsApp for analytics. And let's have a few examples of those. First, what comes to online courses, um, from Moodle log file, it's rather simple to have a look at when do the students study. And no surprise, but it usually happens after the working hours. And that's why I personally, personally have chosen to offer my students a chat time in the evening. And if we continue with online courses, because I don't see my students at all in online courses, they are scattered all around Finland. I need a tool to communicate with them. And I don't like Moodle's chat or messaging services. I rather use WhatsApp, which is much more straightforward method for communicating. And from WhatsApp, I have made some analytics about the messages. On the left hand side there is the course day starting from day zero and I have both a general forum for students and then they send also private messages. And as you can see in the general forum the number of messages drops when the course goes on 
and uh, in the beginning there are lots of questions about how the course is organized and how do I what do I need to do and that kind of things even though there are instruction videos for those as well but students have questions anyways and when the course continues the private the number of private messages increase and typically these are messages in which the students ask about one specific things or something they don't understand in the concepts of physics and I of course then try to answer them when I have time and as I said earlier I offered them a chat video chat time in the evenings every Monday but they prefer WhatsApp rather than a video chat and this can be seen on the graph on the right uh, most of the messages are sent between 9 and 10 in the evening outside normal working hours then a different type of an example I personally don't use sociograms in my teaching but uh, just to give you an idea what it is about um, if you have a discussion forum and you would like to have a look how do the students comment each other's posts it's difficult by just having a look at the list of comments but drawing a sociogram shows it more in a more visual way and if we have a look at the sociogram on the right you can identify the students who have not commented anything and then there is a separate group of course the most active students are in the uh, center of the network and a small group which is active but separate from the others and by drawing this kind of a sociogram it's possible to at a glance see the situation in general then YouTube analytics we have four YouTube channels in physics and TAMC our videos are in YouTube but we share them using links in Moodle and the videos themselves are unlisted anyways we have made something like 1500 videos this far which have been watched for 700,000 minutes and 200,000 times and this generates this spiky picture or graph we see here and if we, if we zoom a little bit take one course there are the spikes and when do they occur surprise surprise it's the evening before an exam so deadlines really make students to take actions the same picture but the different view if we remove the final exam spike from the uh, end of the course and have a look at the actual study time uh, and remember I'm a physics teacher so I really needed to fit an exponentially declining curve to this data to find out the equation and from that we can see that the half-life for enthusiasm is 16 days well this is of course more a joke but well it has a truth in it people tend to lose interest and that's something we I think we all teachers need to do something about because we have produced rather many videos ourselves of course we are interested to know if they have any effect therefore we made a study a couple of years ago in which we used both model data and YouTube data to find out how does the uh, watching of videos affect the final grade and as you can see from zero which is failing grade up to four there is a correlation the more you watch the better grade you get of course it's not a question about watching the videos as such but watching tells about studying and the videos themselves are rather boring so if somebody watches them he or she really wants to learn something from it anyhow if you have a look at the those people who got a five they have they haven't watched as m much as the others and i believe this is because they are good and they know they are good so they don't need to watch videos as much as the others then another view to videos um in a student feedback videos are seen as one of the 
best ways to enhance learning both in blended classes blended learning and in uh, online learning and this of course motivates us to try to improve our videos and that's why we have done something called audience retention analytics and what what does the audience retention mean if a student watches one video once the audience retention is 100 percent and uh, if the, if the same video is then stopped in the middle the retention drops to zero at that point and the third example if a student watches a video finds it very interesting and watches it again from the middle then it can be uh, the percentage can be higher than 100% from those videos which have been watched many times, we can draw some conclusions about how students watch them. And uh, in our physics teaching, we basically have four kinds of videos. Um, those which present theory of physical phenomena, then lecture demonstrations or, or measurements, homework solutions, and uh, instructions for laboratory work. And we had a look at how are these videos watched. And here are some retention curves of all or some of our videos. And uh, then the typical shape we can find in them. In homework solutions, there is a spike at the end, whereas theory videos lose interest rather constantly. Laboratory instruction videos have definite spikes in, in them. And what do all these tell us? Well, homework solution videos had this spike at the end, and I believe it tells that people want to just look at the uh, final answer, or find the answer to the question from the video. So by providing them either a written answer in, in addition to a video, or taking a snapshot of the flash frame would serve them even better. Then theory videos, as I said, lose interest quite constantly. So of course we need to try to make them even more engaging. They are shorter even now, but by adding some interactivity to them, it's probably possible to get this curve a little bit higher. And in laboratory instruction videos, those spikes tell that people try to find a certain uh, aspect of the a certain topic from the video for example how to calibrate a certain sensor so by providing direct links to specific locations in the video would serve the students even better and this can easily be done in youtube you can have a table of contents in a youtube video and this also serves as a link to different locations in, within the video. Okay, then an other view. Um, on the y-axis is the overall activity of a student. And the student ID is in x-axis. And this is one of my physics courses. And I used Moodle's log file to, to have this data. The course is fully online and it lasts nine weeks and the green dots are for those students who finally got a passing grade and red dots are for those who finally got a failing grade and if we continue from week one onwards we can see how these students activity changes and as you can see from week six forwards all those students who finally got a failing grade their activity is very low already. Let's look at it again. So from week one onwards, week six, all the failing students already have lost their interest. So we could use this to try to predict those students who are in danger of dropping out. And what I'm currently doing, I'm trying to find out how do students react to different types of data visualizations and I, I asked one group before they had any own experience about 
analytics that what do they think how would they react and 70 to 80 percent answered that they would be encouraged by knowing their own uh, progress on the course and they would be happy to compare it with the others in the group 10 percent thought that they wouldn't be affected at all and 10 to 20 percent thought that they would be discouraged by this knowledge to find an answer to this question i'm currently providing my students with this kind of data which is shown on the right there is the number of log events for the student him or herself the group average and then the previous cohort and the same for assignments and this is still going on so i don't have the answer yet how did they react but probably pretty soon i will come back with that if you are interested you can find some of our latest results and publications in researchgate slideshare and youtube thanks for watching and please don't hesitate to contact me if you are interested. Bye-bye.